Hello, this is Greg Allison with Green Griggs and Galactic Griggs coming to you on the 21st of February, uh, 2021. In the waning hours of the day, it is 23,3700 hours Central Standard Time. Okay, imagine, just imagine the ozone layer being destroyed, plants and animals dying. Imagine uh, the lightning raging across the tropics like you've never seen it before, huge electrical storms. Imagine looking up in the sky and seeing aurora, dazzling auroras occurring everywhere. Just imagine that the Arctic air is just surging down over North America and Europe, more so than this last uh, episode we've just had, and doing so repeatedly. Imagine ice sheets and glaciers surging. Yeah, <laughs> on return, rebound, and surging. Imagine weather patterns just shifted wildly. Imagine uh, solar storms having a much larger effect, so much so that they'd, they'd take out our power grids all over the world. Did this happen 42,000 years ago? Is this what took out the Neanderthals? Scientists, many of them now believe that is absolutely true. And could this return to us very soon? Some scientists also think that is a huge possibility due to the rapidly changing uh, 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 motion of our poles and the rapidly dropping magnetosphere strength and the growth in the South Atlantic economy. Many other things are on the table and being discussed about these, some pro and con. We're going to go into all that and we're going to talk about the uh, Neanderthals. We're going to talk about uh, what, how Cro-Magnon man may have survived this. We're going to talk about evidence in cave paintings. We're going to look at some African tribes and we're going to talk about what you can do yourself to get through these things. Uh, so Greg, what the heck are you talking about? Yeah, we're also, I'm gonna go through a whole bunch of websites, just blur through them and show you a lot of this stuff. But guys, how do we know this? How, what, what are we talking about? Well, there's several things that you can look at for this. In general, you can tell the location of Earth's magnetic poles over time by separation. For example, uh, where you have rifts in Earth's crust where the continents or plates are being pushed apart, uh, like uh, the South in the Atlantic, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, all the way from you know, above uh, Iceland, all the way down uh, below uh, South America, it's being pushed apart and, and new material wells up. And this happens at a steady rate, at about the rate of the growth of your fingernails. But it just keeps happening. And, it, and it's steady. And it's been going on for a long time. Now, the cool thing is you can look at the rocks, the minerals in these rocks, the iron oxides, they're magnetized and they align themselves with Earth's magnetic field. Well, ever so often you can see the magnet, magnetization flips, which way the poles are. You can see this in these mineral rocks and it does it in bands. You can see it all up and down these ridges and in other similar rift zones, you can see the same thing. And you can chart this back for millions and millions and millions of years. And you can see how the poles have changed. Now, it seems that the poles change, and there's other evidence I'll, I'll go into in a minute. Uh, of this 42,000 year anomaly. Uh, now, major, there's major pole shifts and then there's excursions. What happened 42,000 years ago was an excursion. Typically, we have a complete pole shift generally, and it's not regular. About ever 200, 300,000 years. The last full shift occurred 780,000 years ago. But sometimes there's excursions, a temporary shift, a flip and a flip back. And this occurred uh, back 42,000 years ago. It's called the Lost Chumps event. Some call it the Adams event after Douglas Adams, who, because uh, it was 42,000 years ago, who said 42 was the answer to everything, life in, in, in the universe, in his uh, uh, novel, uh, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. <laughs> so <clears throat> all this said, <clears throat> pardon me, they had, uh, they didn't really see much of this evidence in the Greenland uh, ice cores, but uh, for, uh, for this latest excursion and, and what it meant to the environment particularly. But that did show up in these trees they found in uh, New Zealand peat bogs. They're called kari trees. These are huge, enormous trees, big tree trunks. And they found these peat bogs and they've uh, been preserved for thousands of years. 42,000 years ago, what they found was remarkable increases in carbon-14 right at that point. And they're seeing other indicators of uh, dramatic changes in the environment. 
uh, of course, you can look all over the world and you can see the evidence for the, magic, uh, for the changes in the environment because the ice sheets got really intense again at that time, at the same time. Well, why would that happen? Well, we're going to go all into that. But the, uh, these kari trees are the, the, the smoking gun here where, where they're seeing this primary evidence. Now, the other thing that they're looking at that's showing this evidence uh, is they're also finding in lake sediments and silts now. So there's a new research effort starting to look in these silts to see if they can get a finer tuned record of everything that's going on over some long period of time. That's a whole new research field that's opened up. I'm not going to show you articles on that one because it's still very early in its uh, field of development. But the, you know, you've been seeing probably a lot of articles lately about these car issues. I meant to cover this last Friday and I got, I got everything lined up to go and I realized I had to run because I had to take care of my greenhouse, had to get some fuel for my greenhouses. And I just didn't have time to do this last night. I'd hope to get this done earlier tonight. Uh, so this is probably going to be posted Monday because uh, anything I post after midnight don't do worth the dog. <laughs> I don't get any views hardly. So I'll probably post this Monday. So that's what happens on my channel. I, I'm a busy, busy bee. I don't have time for uh, a lot of stuff like a lot of other guys. I have way too many irons in the fire. So what happened is the magnetic field is thought to have dropped to 5% in, in this Les Chomp, Les Ch uh, Chomps uh, excursion that they had 42,000 years ago. What happened 42,000 years ago is the poles flipped and then flipped right back it, for about 1,000 years. It was not a permanent flip. It's not, you know, they, they consider that an excursion. So this period of flipping, so it might not have been fully flipped over that 1,000 per years period, but that was when the process was in its peak. So and we may be heading to that again. Uh, there's a lot of indicators of that right now, unfortunately. So I'm not saying it's going to happen. <laughs> Don't put words in my mouth, but there's strong indicators that we have better be aware. Like I tell people on my Green Greats channel, keep your eyes wide open and head on a swivel because things are coming fast and fresh. We're living in challenging times, my friends, and this is the last thing we need on top of our backs at this moment. But I'm going to talk to you about things that you can do about it. Okay, so the computer models, though, show that when, when the uh, magnetic drops to 6%. Now, see, they thought it was at 5%. When it drops as low as 6%, a lot more radiation is coming in from the Van Allen belts, and it's just, it will just uh, shred our ozone layer. The protective layer protects us from UV. When you decimate the ozone layer, what happens? You, uh, <laughs> you, you got plants dying. You know, uh, photosynthesis and plants are having a hard time. And when the plants are dying, megafauna is dying off. And megafauna is dying off. The predators, such as Neanderthal man, uh, are in severe danger of dying off. And indeed, Neanderthal went extinct about this period of time. What's going to keep us from going extinct? So these are all good questions. How are we going to eat when there's massive crop failures around the world, like the megafauna? Yeah, our civilization doesn't need to deal with this, but it might have to. Uh, <clears throat> so, and here's the other thing. Uh, what this radiation will do is it will have other effects in the upper atmosphere. It will cause stream ionization. That stream ionization in the upper atmosphere from what happens is the radiation uh, uh, knocks electrons off the atoms. And you got free range in electrons and you got radio, uh, you got positively charged atoms. So the electrical ionization increases a lot. And that's going to increase lightning storms like crazy. It's going to enhance the auroras because even though the magnetic field is, is lower, the poles will be wandering all over the place. And so you're going to have more auroras everywhere. And, and even small solar storms uh, will affect us far more than what they do today, including auroras. And like I said, our grid, forget it, that thing will fry, all our grids. And then we're in deep, deep trouble because I do a lot of uh, videos talking about the risk to our power grids. Guys, we got to get these things hardened. Uh, and we can, we can, but we, we aren't doing it yet. That's why I talk about a lot of my green grids channel, guys. I really beat on it because I've chaired two power grid defense conferences. Let's see, well, what I do, the plaque, here it is. <laughs> I've chaired two of these conferences for power grid defense, my friends. That's my podium placard. All right, so, uh, so the megafauna dies out. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it. See, there was more of it died out during the, a uh, lot more megafauna died out when we had an event 12,500 years ago, which uh, we call the Younger Dryas. We had a sudden intense uh, uh, re-intensification of the ice age, which seemed to be waning, uh, and, and a lot of global changes. Many people th uh, think occurred because of a commentary impact on the Laurentide ice sheet over Canada. That's a whole nother subject matter. But 
so what do we see that kind of indicates uh, in background, uh, background? Well, all at once cave art appears all over uh, Europe uh, and it's red ochre and they're like handprints you know, where people are spitting uh, and, and you see the handprint. Now, maybe that wasn't so much a handprint. Maybe somebody was trying to apply red ochre to their hands more uniformly, spitting it on. And uh, <laughs> what's red ochre? Red ochre is a mineral uh, in red clays. It's an iron oxide, basically. And actually, it's very protective against you, ultraviolet. <laughs> so uh, it looks like people were both hiding in caves all at once. You didn't see this before 42,000 years ago. So maybe 42,000 years ago, people took refuge in caves, including Neanderthals. And they, uh, they were trying to get away from this radiation. And they started covering their skin in red ochre. And I'm going to show you more of that to come. So this red ochre may be one protective measure. <laughs> one of the other sunscreens we have these days might help too. But the red ochre was what they were using at the time. But the sudden appearance of people in caves, the red ochre, uh, the extinction of Neanderthal man, the extinction of a lot of the megafauna. Uh, megafauna dies because it, well, it may be too cold or it doesn't have food to eat. Why would it be too cold? Well, then again, when you got all this radiation coming in uh, from the upper atmosphere, cosmic rays also will, won't be blocked as much potentially. And so it could be that uh, the, you got increased cloud nucleation from all these different processes. Increased cloud nucleation increases the albedo of Earth. And that means Earth's reflecting sunlight. That's what Bill Gates wants it to do. But this happens naturally, far more so. Kind of like sulfur dioxide from uh, the... Uh, large volcanoes. So uh, what this is is, is, is this is another process that can increase the albedo of Earth very significantly to cause a dramatic cooling effect on the ground. So there's, there's more than one potential process that can cause this. But uh, what happens then is that uh, you, your plants are being stressed from too much UV and, and uh, too cold. So you're burning and freezing at the same time. Not a good place to be, my friends. Not a good place to be. Uh, so what do you do? Well, one thing you might want to do real quick is you might want to get yourself prepped with long-term food storage just in case uh, something like this happens uh, while you are learning and relearning your skills for how to survive in this new environment or any, uh, the other stresses that we're having in our society today, which are coming from internationally, domestically, uh, economically. We're on all kinds of stress in our society. So I highly encourage you to go to prepwithgreg.com. Boom. We can get this uh, long-term food storage. You can get two of these, which is a four-week supply, 20% off, or one of them, uh, either way. And you get 2,000 calories per day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's a great price, at which you'll be a winner. It averages about uh, $8.10 or 11 cents per day for three meals. And it's real food. It's freeze-dried. It's lightweight, which makes it easy to bug out with, to carry with you. If you have to bug out in a... A backpack, you got these nice little pouches that you can put in your backpack. They're flexible. That's four servings in that pouch, which is far better than one of these big hard cans, which is just two servings. Take two of these to make that. Of course, they don't have the water in it, but I do. Uh, Green Greg's has videos for how to purify and sanitize water, which are two different things, by the way. <laughs> Not what some other channels would tell you. All right, my friends. Uh, Another thing that we have for evidence that our poles are changing today is uh, one of them might be the South Atlantic anomaly. There's some evidence that that anomaly may be older, maybe it may, might be more stable. But so there's debate about that right now. But essentially, when your uh, a magnetic system starts breaking down, many poles tend to pop up. So that, that's one of the things we're looking at. That is a, a distinct possibility. So I'll go into the South Atlantic anomaly in a minute too. Uh, you know, we used to call it Old Sal, and, you know, it's been there pretty much ever since the space age has been around, but it seems like it's getting stronger. Uh, the magnetic field of Earth is getting weaker, as we know. Uh, so some people think this is, these are both signs and the rapid movement of the North Pole and the magnetic South Pole, uh, which actually the magnetic South Pole is not a geographic North Pole and vice versa. <laughs> That's just, just the way it is right now. A lot of people don't realize that. So um, uh, this, what happens is the Van Allen radiation belts dip down lower because the field is less strong there, and it affects satellites flying overhead, and which are about you know uh, 120 miles up, 
That's, uh, we had to worry about that with the International Space Station when we were designing it back in the day as the Space Station Freedom. All your other satellites have to, they have to be red hard. Avionics have to be red hard for when they fly through that region. Of course, you, know, you have to be red hard if you go through the Van Allen belts and go up to the geosynchronous orbit, even more so. But uh, it's definitely something you have to contend with. So let's, uh, let's go show you some websites. And I'm going to show you a habitat concept I'm coming up with, which would definitely uh, tremendously help you get through a uh, home, a home you can live out of, make a living out of, and grow all your food in. That would definitely help you get through these situations. It's something that I'm developing. So give me a second here, guys. And we're going to go look at a bunch of websites here. Here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look here. In the Neanderthals, link to flip of Earth's magnetic poles, study suggest. And this is a Science Magazine, my friends. This is Science. About Earth's magnetic field acts as protective shield. We all know that. <laughs> From damaging cosmic radiation. Okay. Yeah. So when that cosmic radiation is coming in, uh, it's going to create the ionization the upper atmosphere, wipe out our ozone, let the UV in, and other stuff. So this is where they're tying it to uh, Doug Adams, the Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh, so even scientists have a little sense of humor, even when we're talking about doomsday. <laughs> like I always say, my friends, there's a silver lining around every mushroom cloud. Uh, so look, we see massive growth in ice sheets over North America. We see tropical rain belts in the Western Pacific shifting dramatically at this point. And then the winds, uh, uh, wind belts in the Southern Ocean are drying out Australia. So all this happens at the same time, guys. So what they're saying is we did see massive increases in ice sheets that, that uh, coincided with this drop of the magnetic field. Isn't that weird? Isn't that interesting? So it may be that the, the drop of the magnetic field may be the trigger point for ice ages. So you know, we still have a lot to learn about this. Um, so we're in this quaternary ice age that's been lasting for about 3 million years, and we're currently in an interglacial period. And our current interglacial is getting a bit long in the tooth, so it may, we may be due on these switches. Uh, and by the way, now they seem to know what's also causing this. I'm going to show you that in a minute, too. A uh, study reveals atmospheric changes could have resulted in huge shifts in the climate, electrical storms, and widespread colorful aurora, which I just mentioned. Here, talking about depletion of the ozone. Earth's magnetic field has weakened about 9% over the last 170 years. See what I'm talking about, guys? 9%. So this goes on. This is Science Magazine. So this is coming in, uh, talking from the standpoint of science, my friends. And you know, I'm, and that's why I'm bringing this also on Galactic Graves, because this is a very cosmic event. That our, our artwork is a little bit too fanciful because you don't have the big planets directly behind our, uh, the Earth. <laughs> and the moon's not that close. But, you know, hey, artists, <laughs> artists love to have fun, okay? What can you say? All right, so this made CNN. I think it's more important than what's in science. <laughs> but uh, here they're talking about it. Here they refer to it as the end of days kind of phenomenon. And so this is a lot of the same stuff said here. But since you had no magnetic felt at all, our cosmic shield, radiation shield was totally gone, Turney said. Talking about this event. So, uh, yeah, you see what I'm talking about, guys? This is nothing trivial. An upcoming reversal in the paper published in the journal Science, which we just came out of the magazine of science. Experts say there is a currently a rapid movement of the North Magnetic Pole across the Northern Hemisphere. We already knew this, which could signal another reversal in the cars. This speed alongside the weakening Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, uh, by, for about around 9% in the last 170 years. Yeah, we just covered that. Yeah, so what we're seeing is we could be heading right into this. I mean, just we don't know when. This could happen again. All right, let's get out here. Too many ads popping up. Let's go to another one. Boom. Climate disaster. And this is in Samsung Magazine. <laughs> no, this is LiveScience.com. Oh, my gosh, too many ads here in Live Science. I'm afraid of what might pop up if I scroll down here. Earth's magnetic field barrier surrounded the planet. Originates from a churning of hot molten metal around its core. They're talking about the outer core. Okay, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> 
clues and biscuits. You know, that's the cuts from these uh, ice, uh, from the cuts from these trees. I mentioned the kauri trees in New Zealand. They call them biscuits. You know, talking about their increased levels of radioactive carbon 14. Because why? There's more radiation because things are getting more ionized with all the radiation coming in from the lower of the Van Halen belts and other things. So look here. This is this is cave art that started appearing 42,000 years ago. Red ochre handprints. See this? Red ochre handprints in Spain's El Castillo caverns or caves were made almost 42,000 years ago. I think they have, this actually dates to 39,000. And were suggested to represent the use of the ancient form of sunscreen. Dun, 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 dun. Maybe Homo sapiens, maybe the Cro uh, maybe Neanderthal didn't like the looks of, of themselves with that stuff on them. They might have thought that looked ugly. Might have killed them. Their vanity might have got them. <laughs> They might have died from vanity. They thought they were too cute, too pretty. Oh my gosh, we're too pretty. We can't wear that stuff. We look like an ugly Cro Magnon. <laughs> I think that's what got them. Here's the trees, man. Here they still exist today. This is Yukari tree. A huge trunk on it. A pretty tree. Beautiful tree. Look at that. That's Yukari trees. Old trees, but how old? Yeah. Here they are again talking about this event. The record suggests the magnetic field began to drop 42,350 years ago. And I said they're really pinning it down and reached its lowest level 41,800 years ago, which is 300 years prior to the actual pole flip. Thus, the weakening magnetic field at this time was more of a precursor to the flip uh, uh, than of an impact of the pole swapping. Hmm, kind of what's going on now, maybe, perhaps. Of course, we don't know. We, you know, our, our evidence and science on this is still young, but you know, it's something like I said, keep your eyes wide open and head on a swivel for. Here's another article. This one is in, in something called the Conversation. First magnetic field broke down, massive sudden climate change. Dun, 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 dun. Talking about Neanderthals, large animals, ancient trees. Yeah, there's nothing new in here. I'm just showing. There you go. That's new. Where's your trunk of your tree? Uh, they say these last for a long time. There it is, right there. That's that's the that's what gave us the evidence. Wish we had a nice chainsaw, didn't he? <laughs> Was it a still? <laughs> what kind of chainsaw did they use to cut that? Well, wow, that's a good cut too. I see even. Hmm. Took a big saw. Adams event. They're using some of the same artwork. Using so many other places here. Here we go. This is our Earth's magnetic poles about to swap places. Mm. So here's another article talking about the last reversal being 780,000 years ago, last permanent reversal. So I got to wonder if we had a little excursion even during the Younger Dryas, but it's thought the Younger Dryas was an impact related event. This is uh, you know dealing with the South Atlantic anomaly. This article kind of argues against uh, the notions of uh, they're talking about doing uh, looking at volcanic rock there in this island in the South Atlantic, and they're, they're kind of uh, thinking the South Atlantic anomaly has been around a little bit longer in this article. I'm not sure that's the, the direct evidence of it, <clears throat> at least of that part. This article here is showing you uh, the movement of uh, the uh, magnetic field. And unfortunately, this cuts off in 2007. But what you find is it kind of drifted around this area at about 1994 within these islands in northern Canada. And then it started going, actually, in about 1831. Now, see, this is when the field really started weakening the most. And then it kind of hung around here, and then it just starts moving. And then it starts accelerating this movement. Boom, boom, whoop. And now it's really off here. The magnetic field is racing over toward Siberia to Russia right now. And the south magnetic field, the south, southern gym, uh, the southern uh, geological magnetic field is actually moving too. And it's heading back in the same. They're heading toward each other, actually, kind of sort of. Maybe they converge somewhere around India. Some notion of what's going on in the core of the earth, some artist idea. That's kind of fanciful to me. <laughs> Looks like chaos. Oh my god, what is that? Looks like my hair on a bad hair day. 
<laughs> we go the key the magnetic field greg allison's hair yeah so this is showing how the the uh, uh magnetic field protects the earth it's normally like 10 earth radii going out this way toward the sun and on the other side it goes out past the moon it's like a comet uh, uh in shape the magnetic field the sun solar wind pushes on it so i'm not going to read all that i'm just showing you what they're showing here uh Oh, now scientists might know why. Yeah, they actually think that there's a, uh, that there's a, the core of the earth has got a uh, kind of a, a drum beat to it. It has a, it's strumming, it's got a beat. And that beat uh, actually is driving uh, the changes in magnetic field. Where does that say that in here? Do, 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 I don't know. Let's see here. Talking about magnetic field being rubber bands. Yeah, we say it all the time. There's your crazy rubber bands. I'm not sure this article actually goes in it. Rapid motion triggers magnetic waves that careen toward the core surface, causing geomagnetic jerks. I know a lot of jerks. <laughs> the geomagnetic. I don't think they're very magnetic. <laughs> So could magnetic field ever collapse? Well, yeah, <laughs> we already know that. Oh, well, yeah, this didn't quite get to it, but there's kind of a beat to it. It's got, it puts out a beat from the core of the earth, even though the, it, from the inner core, the outer core seems to be where the field comes from, but it's too hot. Uh, the outer core is where the field comes from. The inner core seems to be driving it though. And here's another, why is it, why is the field strength dipping so rapidly? See, the thing is, the, the rate at which the poles are moving is, is accelerating. Also, the rate at which the, uh, see, and it started really in 1831, the rate at which the uh, uh, field is dropping is also accelerating. So the field is dropping the accelerating rate, and it is also uh it's accelerating and dropping, both accelerated rates. I'm forgetting what you want to just said. <laughs> but really, what we call the North Pole is the summation. It's the average that our needle is going to point to, the average between two different regions that are really the magnetic North Pole. We already have a quadrupole. we got really two magnetic North Poles and a magnetic South Pole. What's what it's showing is this one is increasing and that one's decreasing. So the additive effect is moving in this area. But uh, they think the whole thing is actually about to move for some reason. So, but that's a strange thing going on there. This shows what's happening in 10 years in magnetic field strength. And the, the additive vector adding of where the North Pole is heading. You see, it's, it's really moved up a lot lately. Now, from my standpoint, uh, North has been magnetically in the same direction. Now, if you're out here, uh, it's the angle is a declination has moved. If you're over here, it's moved. Uh, you have an angle of declination. For, for me, it's still, from where I'm at, it's still the same. Look at that. So here it's weakening, over here it's strengthening. All right, Bing. whoops, hang on. I'm having trouble changing my tabs here because <clears throat> Zoom that I'm filming in, had it's tab lowers down every time I come in here. See, this is, a, that's what Earth's magnetic field looks like. A lot of spaghetti here. If you draw the fill lines out, <laughs> this is in Wikipedia, and this is some of your fill strengths. So this shows the quadrupoles here and versus the magnetic pole. I'm not going to go all into that. This is your intensity. This is your South Atlantic deal going on, and we'll come back out. Boom. Inclination, declination. This again is your chart of the movement of the poles. Now see, this one goes far. That other chart ended right here. This shows acceleration is continuing. And so it's past the actual geomagnet, uh, uh, geological uh, North Pole. This is your actual geological North Pole here. that our spins around pretty much. And you can see it's just going straight on. It just wandered around for a while. Now it's a straight line heading out of here, bucking out. Moving on up to the north. <laughs> All right. 
This is your magnetosphere of the planet. And I'm not going to go all into that. This shows you the magnetic changes over time. And it includes excursions. Let's jump. Mono Lake, Blake, Pringle Falls, Big Lost. Hmm, something got lost at that time, huh? <laughs> so this shows you a lot of the excursions. So this happens. The periodicity and something, uh, you know, so this is what sort of measurements in here. Yeah, I can't scroll up there. But uh, I think there's more to that chart than what's showing here. Oops, what we're going to do is didn't want to do that. I was trying to get out of it. Picture, I managed that. So, South Atlantic Anomaly. We talked about that. And you can see what it looks like here. Weakness of the fill. The strong fills are in reddish. The weak fills are bluish, as you can see here. And that's the South uh, Pole's magnetic pole, which is actually the magnetic North Pole. And this is the North magnetic poles, uh, which uh, geological, which are the magnetic south poles. Confusing, right? Well, it's because they flip. <laughs> so here is, I can click this and go to geomagnetic reversal. And we can focus on these specifically. This gives you a little bit more breakdown, it goes over a longer period. Yeah, see this diagram here? That's what they think it looks like during the reversal when you're going from one uh, phase to another where you got north and south poles all over the place. That's why some people think the South Atlantic anomaly may be an indicator. So there's debate about that right now. So I'm gonna give this all one thing. Oh yeah, so what, what do you do for prevention? You know, we can talk about some things like seawater. Uh, if you wanna have a greenhouse, you know, put water overhead. Uh, seawater, uh, uh, I should do this in a separate conversation entirely, but uh, glass and seawater both uh, have some uh, preventative effects. What you have is you have uh, UAV, we're, have, we're talking about ultraviolet radiation being one of our primary concerns. How do we stop ultraviolet radiation? Of course, we can do the red ochre on ourselves. How do we protect crops? Can we put them in greenhouses and, and put something overhead? Glass, well, okay, let me break it down. UAVC gets stopped in the upper atmosphere of the Earth. They don't make it to the ground, typically, although some people claim they're refining it now, maybe at higher elevations. If you get it, you're going to get there first. Uh, UAVB is the type of uh, uh, UAV. <laughs> UVB is the type uh, of uh, UV radiation that uh, gives you sunburn. Glass does stop that. Glass stops it. That's a good thing. Glass blocks almost all UVB. But UVA is the form that actually causes uh, cancers and things like that. It don't burn you, but it does long-term damage and cause the cancers and the age and the degradation of your skin and kill plants. I guess burning can kill plants too. So, uh, but UAV, UAV, <laughs> UV, C is blocked in the upper atmosphere. UVB can be blocked by glass. UVA is not blocked by glass because its frequencies are shorter and closer to that of visible light. Now, here's what they find. They find that now it does, the, the glass will block about 25% of UVA. That's good. And it might be good enough. Uh, let me stop this share here for a minute. <laughs> yeah. It might be good enough that you block 25%, maybe, maybe, uh, for the purposes of plants. It certainly will help because uh, ocean water, say uh, three foot of ocean water is only going to block 20%. That's odd. It seems like, you know, water ought to do better, but it, uh, you're not getting as much blocking with 20, three foot of ocean water as opposed to, you know, a little pane of glass. It's kind of interesting. Glass is denser, I guess, but you know, light gets to it better, so it's kind of odd. I don't know why that's what they claim on that, but 
they claim you have to have it 30 feet, you block all but maybe 1% of the UV. Because you're not getting a lot of light down at 30 feet. Well, here's why I tell you that you don't have to block that much. Because I did this morning investigation, but you know that what they believe is that uh, life can emerge from land onto the um, from the ocean on the land until the uh, uh, ozone layer formed. And the ozone layer was formed because there were these stromatolites growing all over the ocean uh, edge of the ocean, the continental shelves, right underwater, that were uh, big, you know, algae-like plant structures. And there's some today; you can still find them today alive. Uh, the these produced most of the oxygen early in Earth's history, and that oxygen started filling the atmosphere, and it was reacting with the UV and forming ozone. And over time, it formed enough ozone that life were actually, was actually able to merge up out of the water on the land because now it was protected. The water did provide enough protection for life to exist in the ocean for a long time and just couldn't get up on land until the, the uh, ozone layer formed. Ah, uh, but that life in the ocean was only a few inches underwater. It might have got closer and closer over time, but it, you know you couldn't have been 30 feet down. You just wouldn't have had much life or a whole lot of photosynthesis at that time. But you'd have had some, but it just wouldn't have been great. Uh, it's thought that it was you know just a few inches underneath the water, so you don't have to block it all. You just got to block enough. How much is enough? You know, I don't know. Uh, you have to have that the radiation analysis on that kind of stuff. It's very complex. <laughs> I got a friend who just did a dissertation on that. And he did a briefing to the Huntsville, Alabama L5 Society recently. And that's quite a very complex <laughs> briefing. It's very dependent on so many things. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it seemed that a few inches of water was good enough for most life to exist. So knocking out a little percentage, because the question is how much more radiation does it take to, to wipe plants out? We know already that the UA... Uh, I, I, there's a college in Alabama called UAB, and I'm trying to say that. UV, <laughs> sometimes your words get stuck in your mind. I went to UAH, by the way. UV, B, and UVA do damage to plants already. The plants going in the fields today are already damaged by it. They create pigments uh, that protect them from that. And those, all those pigments are very uh healthy for us today that's what we get in our fruits and vegetables our brightly colored fruits and vegetables are brightly colored from pigments that these plants use to protect the fruits and vegetables and the plants themselves from this radiation it does affect them i have seen tomatoes that have been grown from light that was piped in by fiber optics and they grow in like trees you know as a, uh, compared to another plant that would be you know just struggling to, to live because it's not being attacked by these radiations so the uh, plants can, today's plants can grow far better if they don't have to contend with that radiation. That's a fact. <laughs> now, you know, you may want that radiation to help brighten the fruit or something, I don't know. But the, uh, the fact is that plants do better without these radiations, but you know, they need the sunlight to survive. So you know, it's kind of a dual thing. Now, they can take a bit more, but how much more than what, it, what is the level at which stuff starts dying off? Here's another thing we know. The world didn't end 42,000 years ago. It was bad enough that your megafauna died out, which meant most of your vegetation was suffering bad. It didn't get wiped out. Plant species are still here today. There's still plants. If it had got wiped out in that thousand years, we wouldn't have plants in forests today. We wouldn't have wild plants. But what happened is their numbers dwindled significantly. They couldn't support the large game. And, and, or the predators that existed off large game. So uh, as we know, Neanderthal was uh, primarily a meat and eaten species of humanity. 90% of his diet or better came from meat. They were, uh, uh, they were definitely coniferous. Um, so they couldn't handle it. It was too much. Smaller animals usually do better uh, when there's less pickings around because they don't have, have require the same amount of caloric intake. Uh, that's why maybe Cora Magnum man had an advantage that maybe he decided to put pigment on his skin. <laughs> Something that Neanderthal man might have been looking at with disdain. Like I said, maybe he was a little too vain for it. <laughs> the vanity can get you, right? Okay. All right. Enough of all that. Who knows? <laughs> I thought they were so good looking. <laughs> hey, in their own eyes, they were. These skin looking a little ugly 
cool man, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> that was exactly what they would have thought. Because, <laughs> you know, that, that's the way their genes were programmed to, 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 to like each other. You know, anything that was far deviant from that, they wouldn't care so much about. <laughs> Maybe, maybe that's a conjecture. I know that. Okay, guys. So, but what I'm talking about here is it may just take a little bit more protection to get your plants through, just like the seawater. Like I said, you got to go down 30 feet to get where you totally knock the UV out. You don't have to. Plants existed even when we had the UV radiation hitting the ground just a few inches underneath uh, the top of the ocean water. So that's. That's my indicator that at least that's what they think. The stromatolites, you know, they were growing. And now, like I said, over time, they probably got closer and closer until finally things got out. But um, you don't have to knock it all out. You just got to get enough to survive. And there were already some plants that survived this period, and, but some didn't. And we're going to talk about what plants you might want to grow. There are plants that were probably better adapted to it, like quinoa. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so... We're going to go all into uh, top habitat you can live in now. This is going to take me a bit. This, this is why this has got to be posted. I wanted to post it Sunday. I wanted to post this Friday. I, I had everything lined up to do this video on Friday. And, but the weather and things, other things going to knock me out of it. I had too much to do Saturday and today too. So, yeah. All righty. Quinoa, though, may be what you go to. So I, I just wanted to go over this UV. Uh, UVA. We'll uh, go through glass, at least 75% UV, but that might be good enough. Maybe that and just a little water or two planes of glass might do it, might do it. Thicker glass might do it. Uh, you know, it's going to take some analysis to, to, to run this stuff down. Uh, I have did some data searches and I'm not finding a whole lot in short order that, that gives me the definitive uh, everything I want to see on this. But uh, some plants survived this excursion just not enough. So maybe just a little extra protection might make a big difference. Maybe, maybe not. We'll talk about the maybe nots too, how to deal with some of these things. So UVA uh, is the killer. UVC is the burner, which could also maybe kill plants, but UVC isn't reaching the ground now. Now maybe it will in that occasion. Maybe it will reach the ground. Some people think it's coming down now in some degree. Anyway, so uh let's go now back into our presentation go back into share <laughs> look at the uh websites on this stuff so here seawater is an effective filter of shorter uv wavelengths that sounds like it would do uva better that could be so may maybe if you mix water so i looked at seawater because when i did fresh water all i could find was articles on uh uv filters for your wells <laughs> tons of them tons of articles on that it's not really so i, so I searched on seawater because i knew nobody was filtering that so this came up with some good answers but as i was trying to get to the depth that the creatures were living back in the ocean uh prior to oxygen being in the atmosphere I, now these are things that i know i've heard quite a bit in various uh, scientific documentaries but don't always come up too easily so here we go does water block radiation? All that you need to know. Now, there is this. There, this is the best data I found here. It's this chart. It's kind of interesting. Best Buy is all over me tonight. <laughs> the thing that gets blocked the least is visible light. But more on the blue side. In fact, as you go down deep enough, blue light is what you're going to get when you get real deep in the, in the water. And blue light happens to be one of the, you know, blue and red is what plants need. You don't get as much red, though, a little bit. Uh, plants reflect green because that's what they don't, act, that's what they actually don't use. But you're going to get some of this ultraviolet, but not all of it. Some ultraviolet, that's just the longer waves. So I think what we were hearing, I, you know, listen, guys, sometimes these riders, they get things backwards. Uh, it's the longer waves that are being blocked. <laughs> Up to about this one. This seems to be the maximum point for UV getting blocked. But these, as you go to this side of the chart, that's longer waves. Going this way, this is shorter waves. Far IR, bent IR. Now, oh, wait a minute. I'm wrong. But they got this peg wrong. Okay, okay. Pardon me, guys. I got it backwards. These are the shorter waves. 
you got the IR over here. Yeah, ultraviolet is on the side of violent light. That's higher frequencies. So the higher frequencies are getting blocked out here. Okay. UVA is the one closer to visible light. It's getting through. It's a lower frequency. I got it backwards. Hey, I made a mistake. <laughs> so, yeah. And this is why ultraviolet gets to be ionizing when it gets out over here. So this is getting blocked more. So that's the good thing. Water is blocking that. And apparently glass blocks this side. Well, UVB will be higher frequency. Okay. So between water and, and, and uh, Oh, let me let me be succinct and get this right. Whoa, why do you have to scroll like that? Let me get this right. Let me go back up here to this chart. This is UVA. This is UVB. This is UVC. UVB is getting blocked here, and it's also getting blocked by glass. So UVA gets through water and glass, okay? So that's what we're seeing here because it's more like visible light. <clears throat> this is UVA. UVB is longer. Wavelengths. So, I mean, UVB is shorter wavelengths. It's on this side. We go this way. We're going from millimeters to nanometers. So these are shorter waves. Yeah, it's just charts just flip backwards when I'm only used to seeing them. Usually they, they flip the fre higher frequencies to the right. So I got a little bit off, guys. Sorry about that. So let's look at uh, Fed Ochre. <laughs> hey, isn't she cute? Uh, so so what we find is the Hembo women in uh, northern Namibia, and also you'll know that uh, a lot of the other tribes in Africa uh, use the red ochre quite a bit. Um, so she's got this red clay all in her hair, on her skin. Now they wear this all over their bodies. They, they totally coat themselves. That. So there are people that still use that to this day. It's like a resistor. <laughs> They're beads. <laughs> color, color codes on a resistor. <laughs> well, I don't know why the, the, the Neanderthal didn't like the looks of that. <laughs> they just didn't want to be red. <laughs> I don't know. So at least she's got a cute smile, right? There we go. So this is your K paintings, uh, the hand prints I was talking about. Uh, Kuna, Kenwa, excuse me, Kenwa. This is Kenwa. Uh, I'm going to show you the kind of habitat concept too, guys. It's really going to be good for this kind of a, a environment to survive in. Uh, we'll finish that. That'll be the last thing I show today. Kenwa, guys. Look at Kenwa. It's a nutty uh, seed, and a lot, a lot of people think it's a grain. You can eat it like a grain, but it's uh, more protein for any serving than any grain or seed. It's got all nine essential amino acids. It is gluten-free. Guys, this is what we ought to be eating anyway. This is far better than wheat, far better than wheat, far better for you. If uh, it, it helps get rid of this Cialic disease or whatever you call that, it, this stuff is so much better for you. We need to be growing this stuff. The health benefits of quinoa are huge. What's yummy there, right? Make cereal out of it, make breads out of it. Uh, I'll show you a bit more on quinoa. So here it is. The beauty of quinoa though, is that it, it developed in the Andes mountains. In the Andes mountains, you get more radiation of all forms. So plants that are already more uh, in tune with, these are called extremophiles. And a lot of people think these would be the first kind of plants you'd want to grow on Mars or the moon. It's a beautiful plant. Look at that. Beautiful plant. It's probably related to uh, the docks that we have here, the sour docks, the curly docks. Especially curly dock. Kind of reminds me of curly dock a little bit. So this is where it's native to. It's being grown in uh, Spain right now. Oh, oh, that's a natural distribution. Okay, there's a form naturally in Spain. Okay, never mind. Uh, it has been grown over the place uh, somewhat, but this this is something that needs to be cultivated more. This, uh, plant growth is highly variable due to number of different subspecies. So it's got a lot of subspecies. The United States has been cultivated in the United States primary and high elevations. Okay, Colorado. Well, you might grow it in lower elevations when... Now, you can grow this stuff anywhere pretty much. 
but you know there's some places where it's you know they, it's harder to grow with this stuff the stuff will grow it can handle the, the the variations in temperature and climate so it can handle the cold it can handle the radiation this is good stuff and it's good for you not only that um but you can get it hey i got links i'll put a link on this video uh in the show notes and in the pen notes of this video to i've got a special link to true leaf market you can go to true leaf market and you can buy these seeds you can grow this stuff for yourself you can grow it uh as a plant to harvest the seed from you can grow it as sprouts and grow it as microgreens this is this is an awesome awesome plant here quinoa so check it out go to go to my link to true leaf market that will help my channels and it will help you too so we, we both benefit from that and they got all kind of other gardening seeds and supplies here everything you can imagine and want they tell you how to raise your stuff they got great deals and microgreens which are also lend themselves very well to growing indoors which you may have to do a whole lot more of when this kind of a situation occurs of course you have to have maybe some seed plants to replenish your stock with but you might be that you're more eating microgreens than anything else because these things are 40 times more nutritious per volume and weight than uh, up to that than uh fully mature vegetables isn't that amazing and they're beautiful and very tasty the flavor is very intense with these things uh and you can grow them in, in large quantities in very small space indoors and on the green greg's channels i go into that i go all in that and show you how to do that so stop this year hey lou i'm gonna rock it from a balloon and off we go we're gonna do another share i'm gonna show you, take you to presentation and i'm gonna show you another solution so what what are we talking about skin uh what's uh we're talking about wearing uh, stuff to protect your skin, to protect you personally. Uh, and if you don't, if, if the grid's down and you can't have nothing else, you know, some mud made out of red clay. Make your own red ochre. <laughs> Maybe sunscreens will be available. Okay, but if the grid crashes, you're not going to get much of such stuff. Uh, it may be that, uh, you know, you can grow in your greenhouses, but you may have to grow indoors. Hopefully, we'll still have power. Or you can generate your own. <laughs> there we go. Cough grid. So we're about to go into a presentation of my Venus habitat, but we're going to do a subsection of it that's more pertinent to Earth habitats in the kind of environment we're talking about. Okay, this is a habitat concept, a rendition of my universal habitat. And this is from my, uh, let's see if I can make this go full screen. There we go. This is uh, this has been uh, drawn up for me by an architect from Tunis, Tunisia. Her name, hope I don't murder it, is uh, Afif Beji. A F E F. Uh, There's a way she spells that first name, and she's in Tunis, uh, Tunisia. And so I've come up with this habitat concept for a home. You can live out of, and make a living out of, and grow all your food out of at the same time. And the scale of this uh, home is for four people and it covers a tenth of an acre in this home you can grow all of your food just like the and it's based on what the DeVace family does in Pasadena California when they grow everything except for the grain products which they're not using quinoa are they they grow everything except for the grain products on a tenth of an acre and they sell the excess from that and make a living from it so they're growing their food and making a living from their farm on a tenth of an acre in their backyard I've done videos on Green Greg's channel about the uh their vase family and so this house has got a, a greenhouse cover over it now the shape of this is uh variable you can pick various different shapes oh hang on, hang on get them a venus concept there <laughs> so this shows a kind of a walkways now actually the walkways would be smaller and the growing areas would be wider this is her first cut at a, a photographic rendering in a 3d model she's building this in and it's a beautiful home now, the way this is shown is she's got a, this entire, there's another layer completely under this. This is a tenth of an acre of a growing area right here on top. Well, she's actually got another tenth of an acre underneath here, which could be growing area, shop area, or whatever you want to put it in. So you could actually have two tenths of an acre in this home for growing. And if you're growing shelves, you could increase that dramatically, like you might grow microgreens in. <laughs> and microgreens, you can grow so much food, such small space of those things, it's incredible. This is a layout looking at it edgewise. Uh, this would be the growing area 
Well, she's shown it up here, actually. She's shown us living down and she's shown this whole area here being one big basement underground on earth. Now, this is my Venus habitat version of it. And this is the courtyard of mine down here at the workshop level. So you got a workshop that's over 2,300 square feet and you got a living area that's over 2,300 square feet. And then you're going on your roof here and you're going in the courtyard. Well, she's got this whole thing extended in one of her versions and you're going underground here, which is good. These are... Uh, these are like two, fit, two foot thick layers of regular soil or whatever that will protect you from radiation, which would be really good for your uh, UV, right? And other radiation too, uh, which would, uh, and if you had a, a, a nuke war, you'd be a whole lot better off inside one of these habitats. So that was the basic floor plan that I came up with, which is just showing the general outline for the area. This is one based on 50 foot wide and 90 foot long here with a 10 foot roadway in the front. And the back is up against the wall. Now on earth, you might come in if you want to have a garage underneath, you might come in from the backside. She did a version where you're driving all the way through here. I'm not uh, so fond of spending so much space on driveways because it seems uh, not efficient use of space, but you could do that. But she did compensate for that by having a growing area above. So she compensated for that. Now you could have a garage out here, but it wouldn't be as aesthetic though. She's trying to keep it aesthetic. <laughs> Again, this is how her, work out of the room space, which is a little better than my workout. <laughs> and she showed doors and walkways and all, hallways and all that stuff. But she's got a conservatory in the middle here, which is a beautiful addition to this concept. There's so much room in here, you can do a lot with it. She's still got a big living room, kitchen, dining room. You know, you got over here a study for the family, a private study, a bedroom, bathroom, bathroom, uh, uh, walk-in closet, bathroom. Uh, no, it's a bedroom, you know. So here you go from this bedroom through your bathroom into your walk-in closet. I don't know if I put a door right there. I think it'd be just all the way through. But there you go. So you come in here and do all your changing and do everything in your privacy here. And who knows, maybe you'd have a study over here. You can rearrange these things, guys. This is totally uh, fluid what you can do with it. I do like her conservatory concept, having the conservatory in the center. Now here she's got you us walking in this way, see? So a lot of, lot of uh, options here. And this is showing her underground garage here, driving all the way through back into here and kind of a little turnaround space, some stairways, garden and the courtyard. Uh, I think she's got this all, yeah, this is underground too in, in this particular version, uh, or this could be the courtyard either way. And this is your living area. Again, that's, this is the photographic rendering of it. Lots of glass. Uh, it's looking kind of, you know, looking very luministic and uh, white. Now, you, you could totally change all that according to whatever your artistic flair is. Now, here she's got different plants in the growing area, so this looks a lot cooler. She's showing a whole lot of different things growing, including some aquaponics uh, or hydroponics growing here in front of the windows and other places. Nice little uh, plant set up for looking at. It's kind of like ferns there, don't it? <laughs> Maybe it's pineapples. <laughs> anyway, so it's beautiful, lush growing. This is a kind of a bleak view looking at it. Uh, you know, this is just cause this is in a model. So we're not paying any attention to this. It's all right here. Uh, this is all still in development. We're still working on this. This is looking in the door, looking in. Uh, this is your conservatory looking down and she's got some walkways. I would actually, the walkways would be a lot smaller and I would probably put down metal grates to walk over for skylights and you could stop them. Uh, you'd have a shutter underneath so you could shut it off. Uh, she didn't like the metal grates because it looks a little too industrial. I think we could do uh, use tinted glass or something. You wouldn't simp underneath, and if you're on top, who cares? <laughs> Just something to walk on. So I, I think walkways could uh, at least, uh, especially over the living areas, and then we've got to let more light in that area. And this is your conservatory in the middle. She's got a table there with some chairs and things going around it. Now, this is a picture of the conservatory. It's kind of looks like a cool vision from inside this home, right? <laughs> the whole home. Yeah, I, I scaled it uh, in one set big enough to grow large trees in. That's why if you look at it back here, I've actually got this 50 foot up. <laughs> but this is because I got terraces on Venus uh, habitat concept that, that are uh, 50 foot down from each other. So you got to drop a lot, you know, uh, 50 foot every 100 foot. That's quite a slope, right? <laughs> But hey, the gravity is only 90%. You have some strong electric uh, bicycle cars up there to get around there, maybe. 
Again, that's her in her, her inside of it. And here's another view. Uh, this is showing, uh, this is cut off where your uh, the living area would be back to the back. You can't see it. So she took the living area out and she's looking out the front. And she's got, you know, aquaponics. So you could do the aquaponics actually going this way too. Overhead is a layer because you're going to have so much sunlight, kind of like up here. So she get, she's doing this to compensate for having a garage. Now she's bringing the garage into the lower level and she's got garage doors here. And then she's got a growing area underneath. Now it may be if the UV is too bad, that this is where you got to grow everything. Now she doesn't have shelves here. She just got raised beds like you've got up here. Now she did space raised beds and this is drawn more like what I had in mind. She's got some stairwells in here, walkway uh, coming right off the center and a lot of airspace, which is typical for a lot of greenhouses, by the way. Uh, so we've got, this is a, uh, a three layer home, basically. You've got a, a basement or workshop area now, the courtyard here could either be down at that area or elevated. This is the same level that your living area is on. And then you grow on the roof of your living area, and that's an extension of that, basically. So, and again, this is looking at it from another angle. And there's that extension of your rooftop growing area, you see, coming out here over the driveway. So, there you go. This, you know, this is so many ways to do this. It's all optional. When you get tired, you have to go sit down on the sofa. And chat with your friends. <laughs> so there you go. There you grow. You can grow all the food you need in this habitat. You can have in this, you can have your own little uh, 3D printers, lays, pottery wheels, or whatever you want in the uh, down here in this workshop area. This could be a workshop area, business area. You could put a bar. You could put a uh, server farm. You could put a lot of stuff. That's a lot of room, really. Or you can double if you. If she's got this double. She's got this whole thing being a tenth of an acre underground. But you can do that. You can run aquaponic tubes out of these levels, and have growing all the way covering the, the lower level, because a lot of greenhouses put 50% shade cloth on anyway, and that would also block more UV. You could hang. You, you have your glass panel on top, but you could also hang jars with water in it underneath the, your roof. You just hang those jars everywhere. Uh, just glass jars full of water to help uh, block UV. Or if you had to, you could grow entirely under here, uh, reach all the and have artificial lights, and you may have to have your own solar panels or other means of generating electricity. You're not going to need much power in this house, though, because you're not having to heat and cool it with all this thermal mass. So uh, lights don't take as much power, really, usually. Um, although some plants require a fair bit of light, which that could be a fair bit of power. But it... Uh, so there we are, my friends. Home you can live out of, make a living out of. It's intended to be uh, built with, you could uh, either build these walls out of uh, 3D printed concrete block. Or they're intended to be 18 inches thick for to give you sufficient thermal mass, as much underground as you can put it. Uh, I'll show you uh, a, a, another version. Yeah, there's some of that great. Uh, this is a greenhouse. You could do roofs in there like this. You can put two of these would be 60 foot wide. And if you got it 60 foot wide, it would only be 75 foot long, kind of like my greenhouse. Uh, this is, uh, this greenhouse here is uh, Sustainable Harvesters, uh, not far from Houston, Texas. I took this photograph there myself. And this was my one of my earlier drawings for one that's hexagon shaped, looking down it's, uh, the long axis this way, uh, which is, um, which makes it not as long this way, unfortunately. And this gives you a little better idea of kind of what I had in mind in the garden area down here, growing here, solar cells here, uh, the ground level being right here and berms coming up against the house here, uh, kitchen area back here and close to the kitchen and bathroom, bedrooms and bathrooms, you got your hot water solar panel. And here's your photovoltaic uh, electric solar panels and aquaponics tubes overhead. <clears throat> garage, workshop, indoor grow area, store, or factory. You know, you can put 3D printers in here, lays, CNC machines, <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever you desire. You can have your own little additive manufacturing, extractive manufacturing, pottery wheels, looms. Uh, you could grow mushrooms, microgreens, all kind of stuff in it. Whatever you desire. It could be your man cave, woman cave. And this was like, that was for this habitat. It's looking at this way. So this is kind of, uh, not as long this way, 
it's really longer this way. So you're, uh, you don't have as much length within this concept going this way as, as the square, uh, rectangular one I showed you. But that rectangular one was intended to go on inside my Venus habitat, which was, was gonna have a little shell going down inside like this hung inside of a floating habitat. You'll see this on my Galactic Greg's channel, guys. This is on my, and this is a full scale tree, guys. This is a, the workshop, the living area. This is my Galactic Greg's channel. This is the slope. That's kind of steep for earth purposes, but you would have a roadway around each of these terraces. You would have 20 of these terraces, uh, 100 foot deep. It makes the whole thing a mile. This is showing this mapped into this. And that all fits inside of this, my Venus habitat. <laughs> so this is good on Earth or Venus. <laughs> yeah, and it will float. I did a lot of stuff on that somewhere. Where is my, uh, there you go. That is my Martian habitat. And this was done by Michael Laura. He, he worked this out. That's inside of it. It's outside. It's me in my space suit. See green, Greg? <laughs> and this is on the inside. And I'm comparing that. I got this photograph here of my other original concept from which Mike Lore fleshed this out in a Kitely simulation. And I've got a video on that. This is the notions for Mars or um, lunar habitat with concrete and water overhead to protect you from radiation. So that's just a notion one. Now he's actually drawn this out. He's got huge things of water hanging overhead in this now in that simulation. So yeah, this is my Venus habitat. I've got a lot more work I'm doing on this. So I'll show you that stuff on the, my Galactic Greg's channel soon enough. Let me stop this share. All right, my friends. <laughs> there we go. Earth, Mars, Venus. This is a good home that will get you through. Uh, you can build these walls out of sandbags. You can build them out of tires and pound dirt in them. It's very labor intensive though. I think sandbags are probably how I'm going to implement them myself. I'm planning to build a couple of these. I'm planning to build... That's more than a couple. I'm planning to build them here in Alabama and in my uh, farm ranch in Arizona. So I'm planning to build them in two different climates to show you the variations and how that's to be dealt with. So it will give me a chance to work out a lot of the specifics on this. I'm probably have to do a GoFundMe to be able to cover the cost of, of developing these. But these will be homes you can live out of, make a living out of, grow your food in, uh, you can work from home this way. Uh, you can have your little industries, shops, stores inside of it, however you want to do that. There's so many things you could do with this concept that's not funny. There's so much you can do. But it, it, it basically would erase your environmental footprint off the face of the earth. <laughs> You'd have a no footprint. It's so green that, 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 that it'll make Greta turn green. <laughs> it's so green, we may have to strip mine in West Virginia and burn all the coal fields to put more carbon back in the atmosphere. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I hate to have this strip mine of mountains. It's ugly. <laughs> uh, I could have a little fun though, right? You know, I'm just teasing guys. I wouldn't do that. But it's it's, it's super green. Um, which might be a problem. We may be coming in the ice age. But the cool thing about living uh, like that, where you got so much thermal mass around you, you're more resilient against temperature changes. It'll be the hot or cold. And I can go more into that. And I have covered that in other videos. So uh, this is a cool concept. I'm developing it. It will be earthquake proof to more so than a regular house. It'll be more resilient to fires, not floods, <laughs> unless you're an upper level, <laughs> not floods. And we can work on that though. Oh, if you're in the balloons floating around the atmosphere, which you can do that on earth too. Yeah. Or you could build these things to float in the ocean. Guys, this concept is so versatile. You're not going to believe it. I am working on it. Look, I just showed it to you hanging inside of a balloon a mile wide in the atmosphere of Venus. You think I'm crazy. Go see it on Galactic Greggs. And I did a video on green graves about how green this is, how it's the greenest concept. It's supposed to have on Galactic Greggs too. Okay, guys. So there you go. We have a lot of things that we can do, but basically modern agriculture would collapse under this situation. People in the cities would be starving to death. It would be horrendous. Um, I got this home concept. It's not, I would never come up with something to tell people they got to live in. That's what a lot of people do. Well, you got to, this is what everybody's got to do. You got to do this. You got to do that. I think we can make something so attractive that people couldn't imagine themselves living anything else. Cause I think it's going to be a beautiful home. You can see it's definitely have the greenery. You could uh, decorate the walls in any manner. You can also use uh, colored bottles like the earthship houses in them, make them pretty. You can make them artistic, use stained glass. 
You could use water uh, as some of your radiation uh, shielding in addition to the glass, especially if you have glass overhead, that water might help catch some of the rays, but you smaller panes. So you gotta, you don't wanna have glass in the ceiling that's gonna crack and then you look up, see what's happening, get glass in the house. So you gotta have some safety precautions for that. Uh, polycarbonate uh, and uh, poly uh, are used a lot for, you know, greenhouse roofs. Uh, I'm not sure we wanna use a, a film plastic, but you could. In some areas, that's good enough, like Alabama, typically. Um, there's a lot of versatility, a lot of options to how to lay these things out and do them. Uh, I'm setting forth the basic principles. I'm going to build these things. I've been working on this concept for a couple of years now, and I'm going to keep more and more into it in time coming. But uh, it's a very resilient concept. So, yeah, hey, you can help me, help my channel, help yourself by clicking the links. And... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, below, go on to prepwithgreg.com. You have to click the link for that. Just type it in your computer and it can take you into those specials and all kind of other long term food storage and prepping supplies. If you click on the uh, My Patriot Supply logo there, and you can also go to uh, my link to True Leaf Market and you, your quinoa seeds <laughs> and other seeds. It is growing time now. Get your seeds now and get started. You know, you need to know how to grow your own food when this happens because. Yeah, the agriculture is going to be gone. <laughs> Grids down, your tractors aren't going to be able to get diesel fuel to run the tractors. They're not going to get spare parts. Everything's going to unravel, collapse whole society unravel. It will be a very ugly time if the grid goes down because of this stuff. Don't have to. We ought to be working to get the grid hardened so we'll be resilient to this. Uh, so that's another thing I'm pushing. So help me out, guys. Go on with me and let's get all these things done. But for now, I'm going to say, there are challenges in our future. There's some big challenges. Well, the right ideas, we can work our way through it. If we, we can come with ideas to colonize space, we can preserve ourselves on Earth. That's what I'm saying. We can do it, but we got to have the will to do it. But you also got to have the will to survive yourself. This habitat's going to be an excellent way to go in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, build your homes, lots of thermal mass. <laughs> Underground homes are good. Earth ships are, you know, uh, a step in the right direction. I go a step beyond our ships because our ships you do not grow all your food in. Uh, it's not you know, the device unit that I use, <laughs> but it's a step in the right direction. Underground homes are a step in the right direction. Any home with lots of thermal mass is a step in the right direction. Lots of rock or whatever. These are all steps in the right direction. You can actually retrofit your current home to, to get it moving more and more in that kind of direction. And thermal mass, put sandbags up against the wall, build another wall, put rock, you know. Cover your house in thick rock, not you know veneer rock, <laughs> like real rock, <laughs> lock and block, or put in blocks and fill it full of sand. You know, there's there's you, know, you can get uh, you can get block that is about twelve foot thick, twelve inches thick. Excuse me, it's late night. It is now. <laughs> it's now the twenty second. <laughs> it is also now uh, twelve fifty one a.m. So uh, that is oh. 50, it's zero zero fifty one hundred hours Central Standard Time. <laughs> it's the time on deck, and I'm now what happened. I had to split this video, so I'm gonna have to run it through a compiler. So this definitely is not gonna post uh, the day that I made it. Anyway, my friends, what's up? Well, yeah, it'll post. I'll post it today. Now it just won't be. I hope to post a Sunday night. Not happening. I thought I might post it Monday morning, iffy, by Monday afternoon. Yeah, definitely. Anyway, my friends, with all that, I'm going to say thank you very much for watching. Sorry for going so long. <laughs> but I had a lot of information to pack in here. Thank you all for watching.